Good morning, this is Roger Thunder Wakia with the Red Road channel. Welcome. I'm going to do a video today on uh, Cochise and the Cut the Tent incident. But before I do that, I just want to welcome the new subscribers. Uh, seems to be an influx and also uh, more views. And so always happy to see that. I'm just the storyteller here, uh, wisdom keeper storyteller, passing on intel and information about the Old West and uh, trying to do that in a pictorial sense instead of just telling the story. Still juggling around and trying to get all that stuff in order, so you'll just have to bear with me. So let's just jump right into uh, the video, and then I'll talk more later about other things, like the channel and that type of thing. This is Cochise. This is what this story is about. Cochise and the Apache people, and uh, how the wars all started with the uh, Bluecoats. How it all kind of kicked off and got inflamed or exaggerated or led into disproportionate uh, dis disproportionate reality. Cochise, there are no known pictures of him, just like there are no pictures of Crazy Horse. But he was a very he cut a fine figure let's put it uh that way one of the one of the agents at the uh, apache pass tell us i believe his name was was an acquaintance of cochise because he used to come in there all the time he camped out nearby and uh his description of cochise was just quite quite the uh Quite the figure, quite quite the specimen of a of, of a true warrior and and uh, good looking and uh, good in stature. Now his name Cochise came from Cochi, I think, or Cheese might have been another uh, pronunciation or another form of the name Cochise, which meant the nose. And that's because he had kind of a Romanesque nose. But still a good looking man all the way around, a handsome individual. And he was uh, born in 1810 to the Chahokan tribe, or band, I should say, the Chahokan. And when you look at things like this, you have to realize that bands were parts of tribes or parts of people like the Chiricahua people. And there could be several bands. There could be the Badonkahe, which Goyakle, the uh, Geronimo came from, and Chiene. And <clears throat> so there were different bands that uh, were encompassed in uh, the tribes as a whole. It can all get rather confusing. So here you have the supreme uh, chief of and well-known of that time and in history of the uh, Apache people, or let's say the Chiricahua people. And that this again is what this incident is based on. The cut the tent incident. And that occurred around this area, Apache Pass. Let me let me do a uh, quick shot of uh, that area. This is a shot of kind of around that area. You got the saguaro cactus there that are only found in Arizona, and a peak there, and then right around this peak was Apache Pass. And again, that's where Cochise camped out all the time, and. He was a regular at the station, the Butterfield. I think it was the Butterfield line that went in there. And he was permissive. He didn't make raids on uh, this line. He allowed 
freight and passengers to go through and uh, had a pretty good relationship with the station master there although they often got into arguments because uh well let's face it uh cochise didn't like the incursion of the white man and or the white eyes as they were called and so there were heated conversations but basically they generally got along but everything erupted out of this area here the famous apache pass now the station there was pretty cool it was an adobe station it had all kinds of rooms and uh, amenities and uh, places for like say the stage people st uh, the passengers on the stagecoach to eat things like that here's kind of a shot of a stagecoach of that area butterfield stage line just to give you an idea, just to give you kind of like, let you, you know, indicating the ambiance, so to speak, of uh, that whole situation. Here's another archival photo uh, that shows probably that same area. It looks like that same area where they're coming in and... Uh, on the stage the passengers on top and uh, inside as well just to give you an idea of the whole situation uh, back then so basically uh, let's get back to the cut the tent incident uh, what happened was Cochise got this message and this is another rendering of Cochise another painting looks like he's holding a uh, henry repeating rifle or a winchester coach he's got a message uh i guess if my if my memory serves me uh, correct it came through this agent that was the uh caretaker or the the head honcho of this uh, stage uh station stage manager got a letter off or a, you know uh, some kind of communication off to Cochise that he was to come in and uh, talk to the, the the blue coats wanted to have a meeting with him an amiable meeting a powwow that type of thing now i don't know if Cochise really actually knew what the incident was that they wanted to talk about but it was surrounding Mickey Free, which I mentioned in an earlier video, who was a scout. Let me go and show you a picture of Mick, Mickey Free. This is a picture of Mickey Free. Second from the right here, this individual. Right there. Now, he was just a kid at this time, okay? Mickey Free. But his real name was Felix Ward, and, and if you watched a previous video on the Apache people, I covered a little bit about how this whole thing went down, but I, I'll, I'll have to cover that more now, seeing as this is a separate video. But as you could see here in this lineup, you had all these Apaches in here, and... Uh, You could see that these are all dark-skinned people here, except for Mickey, who was white. He could have been a—he could have been had a little bit of uh, Mexican in him, but predominantly his—it is said his hair was a reddish color, or a dark reddish brown, or that that type thing. As a kid, he was hanging out in the uh, in his father's ranch one day at his father's ranch and there was a raid there by apaches and his father johnny ward was out and his mother were out they were not around at the time they had left him there and when the apaches came in to raid the place which they often did at the border some of these borderline ranches in that area uh johnny ward's ranch was chosen that day and uh, 
So Felix Ward, or Mickey Free, as he later be, uh, was known or became to be, which is an interesting name in itself, Mickey Free, uh, climbed up into a peach tree uh, to get away, to be not seen by the uh, the Apache raiders coming in. So as he was hiding in the tree, one of the guys spotted him. It was the, it was the chief, the guy that was the head of that raiding party, came in and spotted uh, Mickey Free or Felix Ward up in the tree there and uh, got kind of a laugh out of it, uh, realized it was just a kid, came up closer and uh, started conversing, who are you, what, what, something of that nature, and noticed that the kid had a bad eye. Well, this chief, the guy that was leading this band, he also had a bad eye, it is said. And so uh, he had empathy or compassion or whatever for the kid and thought, wow, he's, he's got an infirmity just like me. And so rather than killing the kid, he took the kid into custody or took the kid as a captive and they, uh, they headed back to the uh, encampment, the Apache encampment. And uh, from that point on, Mickey Free or... Felix Ward became an Apache. And, you know, why did he become an Apache? Well, uh, I don't know if he tried to escape or not. I'm thinking that basically he got comfortable with it and felt like this is something he wanted to do. And so he was trained just like all the other Apache kids, warrior men, young men to become warriors. Uh, got trained in their ways, which uh, included all kinds of different tests and swimming and hiking and running. And man, they could run like you wouldn't believe. The, their legs were their best friend. I mean, you know, Apaches could run like the wind and they could run 80 miles in 110 degree weather. And one of the tests was keeping water in your mouth, uh, taking us a mouthful of water and running up to the top of a mountain in blistering heat and coming back down without swallowing it, that type of thing. So they were trained really well, trained how to hunt and all kinds of stuff. Track, best trackers in the world. So maybe Mickey just kind of liked this lifestyle. Uh, what are you going to say, you know? But again, this, not to get too far off track here, this, it was all about this kid getting captured that this meeting was arising between Cochise and Bascom. Now, who's Bascom? Let's take a look at Bascom. This is Bascom. This is a blue coat. This is, a, I forget what his rank was, captain or something. But he was trying to make a name for himself because he just got appointed to this area, uh, this Arizona area and, and that particular area around Apache Pass and he was trying to make a name for himself uh, trying to uh, be haughty didn't probably have to try probably was just that way anyway but he used the situation to try to gain notoriety let's put it that way and so uh He's the one that sent out for the, the message to Cochise, come on in, we need to talk. Cochise uh, went in, uh, again, he was pretty amiable as far as going into powwows and that type of thing. Trusting, let's put it that way. So he went in to meet up with Bascom, and when he went into the encampment, well, there was a tent there that was... Uh, the run-of-the-mill tent for uh, the blue coats, you know, uh, the square type tent, not the teepee, but the square type tent with the flaps and all that good stuff. Some, some, uh, some were more decked out than others inside, depending on the rank of the officer. But he was invited, and so he uh, proceeded to go to this encampment. Uh, and to enter 
into the tent with this Bascom, okay, was greeted warmly and all that good stuff. He brought his wife with, with him, Dostese, who is pictured here. He, he felt comfortable enough to bring his wife, and he brought his son, Naiche, and he brought uh, some warriors, young warriors, with him as well. Just kind of like a little entourage to go in there and talk. So they ended up going into the tent and uh, sitting down. And I think there was another guy there named Robinson. And also uh, Johnny Ward was there. Now Johnny Ward was, again, Mickey Free's father. And at that time, uh, his father was incensed and made a big deal out of, uh, and I guess you would if it's your son, wanted to know what happened to his son, wanted him re recovered, wanted him back safely, that type of thing. <clears throat> you can't blame him. But I think that on one hand, not only did he want that, but he also kind of had a vendetta of uh, retaliation against the Apaches. Now, again, I say that uh, Cochise brought in Dostese, and as well he brought in his son Naeche, which is, this is a much later, this is a beautiful photo, actually, a colorized photo of him. He probably looked a lot like his father, I'm thinking, like father, like son, you know, that type of thing. So this could just as easily be Cochise, uh, in a sense, all right? Look pretty much probably the same. Although Naeche at that time was not this old. Again, he was like probably around 10 years old when he was in this incident. So he brought, Cochise brought his wife and Naeche and, and the warriors, and they proceeded to arrive at this tent, and they were ushered into the tent. Now, the warriors didn't stay in the tent. They and I think uh, the wife, his wife and uh, son, were with the warriors. Were ushered off into another tent so that they could have this this discussion. And this discussion involved uh, the missing of this kid, and and also you know who else was there uh, remained in the tent was uh, Coyuntoro. Co Coyuntura, which was Cochise's brother. Now, they sat down in the tent, and they were offered coffee and all this good stuff, and uh, tried to be, you know, tried to make them feel at home. Uh, it was actually trickery, because then Bascom turned around and ordered his uh, lieutenant, or whoever it was, uh, named Robinson, to secure the tent that all the, the people that had just left the tent, in other words, the warriors and the wife and child, they were to be secured. And he gave this order, and when he gave this order, uh, Cochise, let's get back to a picture of Cochise here. Cochise picked up on what was going on. I mean, uh, so did Coyuntura, his brother. They both kind of had that sixth sense where they were picking up on stuff and they were they probably picked up on the lingo and figured out what was going on that you know the people were being put in guard uh, under guard and uh, realized at that moment that something was fishy and then Bascom uh, proceeded to get intense about we got to know where this kid is and you better come up with this, you know, you better tell us where he is. And, of course, Cochise was denying the whole thing, rightly so. Didn't know uh, the actual, what actually went down. In fact, he thought at the time, and he said to Bascom, I'll, I'll find out about this. I'll find out who did it. He had kind of had a feeling that the Coyotora, Coyotoro, Tora, <laughs> Indians had done this. This is hard because you got two guys with this, you got a guy, his brother, 
Coyuntura and Coyutero, and you got the Coyutero Indians. So you'll have to forgive me here. Get a little bit tongue-tied uh, in this situation. But anyway, he was saying that it wasn't his uh, blame. Uh, you know, he would find out who it was. And uh, Bascom was just being, uh, and Johnny Ward, was uh, the father, was sitting there. And they were adamant, and they were getting uh, intense and uh, demanding that they weren't going to go anywhere. They were going to be held hostage in, until... Uh, this could be worked out or something could be, you know, until he came up with the truth or whatever. There was, there was an argument. So Cochise, being the supreme warrior that he is, slipped his knife out from wherever it was, his sheath or wherever, turned around and uh, to one wall of the tent and stuck his knife in and slit it and uh, cut it, thus cut the tent episode. Well, at that point, Bascom and Johnny Ward realized that uh, he was making a quick move, and he did, and he was through the through the cut in a matter of seconds. And at the same time, Bascom was screaming out, "Shoot him! Shoot him! Don't let him get away!" And uh, Johnny Ward was pulling out his gun. And Cochise was making for a hill or a mountain uh, right by there and uh, made it, started running up. And Johnny Ward again pulled out his gun and shot at Cochise. And Cochise took a wound to the leg but just kept going and uh, got free, got up on top of the mountain. And when he got up on top of the ridge, let's say, it was probably more like a ridge, when he got up on top of the ridge, he looked down and yelled, Apache blood is just as good as white man's blood. I mean, he was pissed. He, you know, he, he, he realized that he was totally deceived at that particular time. So basically what he did is he made his way back to his camp, which again was around Apache Pass and uh, the stage station and that whole thing. So he went back there and uh, it, to do some serious thinking and planning at that point because he realized that his wife and kid were there and that the six warriors were still there and that he had to somehow get them released. Here's another picture of Mickey Free, by the way, that I just throw, thought I would throw in real quick here just so you know he how he looked later on in life, more seasoned veteran, patchy scout for the Blue Coats, decided to uh, go that route like the Apache Kid did. But he is much more seasoned here, and uh, quite a good photo of him, actually, colorized photo, so I thought I would just throw that in. But let's get back to... Uh, what happened further in this incident after Cochise climbed the hill, got away, got wounded, got back to camp. Here's a picture of the Apache Pass stage relay station. Kind of a dramatic photo which showed all kinds of goings on there, how Apaches were around the area. And eventually there, there was a war that broke out there. Uh, Guys behind the wall, blue coats, ended up, Bascom went there. Uh, Cochise was nearby. Uh, there was talks back and forth. There was yelling. There was couriers. Uh, again, I think Cochise came out and uh, met with Bascom again. And Basically, it just turned out being a yelling match. And uh, so basically what happened after that was, uh, I think Cochise uh, and his warriors captured uh, some men in a stagecoach. And there were white people in there as well as Mexicans. Now, they didn't get along well with the Mexicans at all. Uh, they were kind of brutal bitter enemies, really. They had no love for one another. 
So when he took these captives, uh, he had in mind, Cochise, uh, what he had in his mind was that he was going to somehow exchange. If he took captives, he could exchange them for the captives that Bascom had of his people. And when he took these people captive, uh, he took them out of the coach, of course, and uh, what he did at that point was in order to drive the point home that he was serious, he took the Mexican guys out and tied them to the wheels of the stagecoach and burnt them alive. And that was a typical torture of the Apache people. They had all kind had divided devised all kinds of ways to get back at the white men. Why? Because Cochise's father, and there was just a whole history uh, that was started actually by the white eyes. All right, the white eyes were the ones that made incursions. The miners, the white eyes, all these people, the blue coats are the ones that came in and started doing things like scalping and uh, they did horrible atrocities uh, d dismembered people cut people's heads off uh, did all kinds of things to the apache people so when you're you know if you if you're uh, taken back by the fact that apaches tortured people uh, they just did it they just uh, looked at the white man as an example and i i saw an interview once with an apache man a descendant of it was either geronimo or one of the other uh legends of that time i saw uh, an interview and basically what he said was that hey you know they started the torturing and they started the scalping and they started uh doing all these atrocities so we just decided we're going to do it better and they did. And what happened was, is they devised all kinds of ways. Another another thing they did, uh, you know, uh, was hang people upside down from a tree, a tree limb or something, and start a, uh, tie their hands behind their back and start a fire underneath their head. Yeah, I know. Pretty bad, huh? But this was just a culmination of uh, both sides doing atrocities, all right? So basically what the Apache was doing was fighting fire with fire. No pun intended here since we've got one going on the screen. <laughs> but that's what they did. And so they didn't kill the white captives of the stage they captured. They, ki they killed the Mexicans because they really cared. They didn't, they didn't think the white man really cared about Mexicans anyway, but their own kind. So they kept these other whites alive so that they could go back and take a courier or a message back to Bascom and say, look, this is what they did. Or they sent a message saying, this is what they do. This is what we did to some of them and the rest of them are going to have the same fate if you don't let our people go. Well, back at the camp, back at the, uh, you know, the Bascom uh, camp, uh, the, there was discussions about this and whether they were going to let the hostages, the Apache hostages go, the warriors and the wife and son, that type of thing. Whether they were going to let them go. Well, at now... Now this whole incident was coming to the attention of superior officers of Bascom. One guy's name was Cook, I believe, C-O-O-K-E, and another one, uh, another one was Moore, M-O-O-R-E. And these guys, I think Moore was head of the Dragoon, uh, the, the Dragoon, Dragoon emplacement, and, uh, they were superior officers, so they came in and, and ha started having heated discussions. Or maybe they weren't so heated. They just had discussions as far like, you know, what are we going to do? We're going we're gonna to have to kill these. We're going to have to hang these Apache hostages. And Bascom at that point was like, I don't know. I don't know if that's the right move. He, he wanted to ma maintain control. 
And so, believe it or not, uh, they sat down in a tent somewhere and pulled out a deck of cards and uh, started playing this game called 7-Up, supposedly. And they played this game, and it was almost uh, in a jokingly, a joke, you know, a jokingly type way, where they made a game out of whether they were going to kill somebody or not. And uh, I guess more whoever won out because he was for killing and hanging and getting rid of them and setting an example. And that's exactly what they ended up doing. So they took the Apaches and I think there were six all in all. I think there was uh, Kuyun Tora, Kuyun Tora, that was... Uh, Cochise's brother, and then the five other warriors, and they decided they were going to hang him. They took him up on the hill, and they hung him, and they hung him high, because they wanted him to hang there, as an example. They hung him real high, because they didn't want the animals to get, and they just left him there after they hung him. And, you know, they pleaded, the hostages pleaded, the Apaches, hey, you know, Okay, you're going to kill us. They weren't afraid to die, but they didn't particularly want to die being hung. And so they asked to be shot. Well, no, that was bypassed. They were going to get hung because if you, you know, if you knew an Apache didn't like something, you were going to do it to them. So they hung them up high and uh, they just let them, uh, they just let them, let them be there for months. I mean, you know, they just basically rotted. Uh, till they fell to the ground and then uh, they were washed back into the earth. But all the time this was happening, okay, that, you know, when, when Cochise finally realized that they were hung and his brother was hung, they were, of course, incensed. I thought I'd throw this picture here, here towards the end. Uh, of what it might have been like a painting of the Apaches firing down at the uh, in Apache Pass, and uh, you even got Goyafwe in this picture, and uh, possibly Lozen off to the right. So basically, to sum all this, let's say this story or this portion of the story of the Apache people up. Uh, I'll just say this. Uh, let me let me uh, let me get back up here on the screen. I'll just say this that uh, this is what broke everything wide open. This incident and uh, the Bascom affair, the Cut the Ten affair, the Mickey Free affair, however you want to label it. This is what broke everything wide open as far as the battles between the Apache Wars in general, the the uh, intensity ramping up, that type of thing. These incidents happen all the time, you know. Uh, the Apache basically uh, came came to the conclusion early on that they were going to try to make peace because of the incursion and. They just didn't want to fight so much, and they just want to be left alone. Even if it meant living in a certain area, or reservation, or whatever. Eventually, they didn't really want to do that. That wasn't their main goal. Their main goal was just to be left alone and make peace with, see if they could coexist. And all, all of these kind of meetings, like the Cut the Tent meeting and other meetings, uh led to the deception of the, you know, them being deceived by the white eyes. Incidentally, white eyes is a term, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but white eyes is a term of a, a descriptive term, not a derogatory term, just meant the whites of the eyes of the Americans or the, the white man were whiter than the Apaches, because that was almost like a coffee color. I, I mean, uh, there was a brownish hue to the Apache whites. 
of their eyes. So that's why they called him the wide eyes. And that wasn't necessarily, uh, necessarily a derogatory term, just like the long knives with the Lakota people when they said the long knives was just a descriptive term. It wasn't any kind of racist term or anything like that that might, people might think. But these meetings were always being, uh, they were always being betrayed at meetings. Uh, you, had, uh, you had the incident of Mangus, Colorado, who I mentioned earlier, or did I, was the father-in-law of Cochise. And uh, he came to a bad end as well uh, with his trusting attitude towards uh, trying to make peace and trying to meet with the white man. So anyway, I just wanted to present this incident. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed the uh, photography and the, the paintings and stuff like that. Again, uh, I will have more stuff coming up. Um, I'm kind of new to the idea of mixing photos in with me just sitting around and storytelling. So I'm trying to, I'm still juggling that around. At the same time, I'm trying to remember things and uh, put in photos and tell the story at the same time and remembering. I can't remember every fact and figure. And I love comments, though, when people come on and say, wasn't so-and-so the uncle of... So that shows me that there's some good people out there paying attention, liking my stories, liking the channel. And... Uh, just enjoying a, a look at history and how it may affect what's going on today, you know, and it, there, there are strong parallels. And I could get on my soapbox about that, but I'm just going to kind of try to keep this right now as more like in the entertainment history, uh, looking at history, looking at the real facts instead of the phony facts. The phony history, that type of thing. If you like this channel, please uh, feel free to, uh, we, we accept donations uh, at spiritofcrazyhorse.com. If you go there, there's a donate button off to the right. My books are there. Listen to the wind speak from the heart and emergence, as well as the Red Road Prayer Circle and the email if you want to join that. And I'll talk more about that later. But really do appreciate support in any way you can give it. Uh, thumbs up, uh, subscription, all that good stuff. Seems to be like there's an increase in subscribers now and uh, more views. And uh, people are liking this kind of thing. So if you like it, I like it. And uh, so I guess I'll just leave it there. Uh, this is Roger Thunder at the Red Road saying uh, thank you, Wopila, and uh, Aho.